Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed. I am a resource scientist at Cohere for AI. So I'm pretty excited uh, today because we have Sebastian Ruder with us for our fireside, ch uh, fireside chat. So I'm sure most of you know Sebastian, but just I mean I I would like to briefly introduce him. Uh, then I mean we can start uh, our our kind of chat. So Sebastian is a resource scientist at Cohere, working on making LLMs multilingual. So I kind of uh, plagiarize this phrase from uh, your blog, uh, Sebastian, because I really like how you phrased it. So before Cohere, he was a research scientist at Google DeepMind. He was co-authored of many very impactful work that are ranging from multilingual and cross-lingual learning, multitask modeling, modular transfer learning, and evaluation uh, very broadly. So also you may know him from his great blog posts, like such as uh, Gradient Descent Optimization, Multitask Learning, Transfer Learning, Cross-Lingual Word Embeddings. Uh, I wanted to say this because uh, somehow during my PhD journey, uh, I mean, uh, my PhD journey in general intersect with Sebastian work in multiple times. Like I started my PhD working on cross-lingual embeddings and his blog post, like kind of survey paper was one of my, uh, how do you say, like bedside paper. Then Multitask Learning was same. And we kind of, I was lucky to, have a chance working with him as well. Uh, but now we work for Cohere together. So which is also, which is very, very, very nice. So yeah, that is a very brief introduction. Feel free to drop any question uh, to QA. So I will leave some time at the end and I will try to ask your question to Sebastian. So welcome again, Sebastian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Ahmed for, <laughs> for the invitation we, we just chatted before. And yeah, we had actually, uh, talked about having this five, five side chat before I joined Cohere. So it's funny that we are colleagues now actually talking about things in the setting. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was very, very nice. Uh, and I I wanted to believe that that is a, maybe like a small <laughs> positive <laughs> impact, like inviting you here. So it's like a first step <laughs> to the door. So yeah, I, I, I would like to start maybe like a kind of my classic question for fire chess, like uh, ch chess, but like, uh, probably you are all kind of curious like how did you start like kind of getting interested in about i don't know computer science maybe artificial intelligence and when exactly um sure yeah i mean what i what i really like about uh, like our field or like nlp um kind of uh uh yeah computational linguistics as well is that people have so many different like backgrounds or come into field from from very different like perspectives or with different interests and so um yeah like personally i have uh growing up or like in, in high school i was really interested in just uh, languages themselves like learning different foreign languages in, in school but also more the linguistic aspects like like grammar of them um but i also really enjoyed kind of more the analytical side of things so more uh yeah math and uh, later programming too and I was basically looking to, uh, for something that combines these two different areas of interest. And through doing some, some research about potential uh, areas of study, I came across uh, what at the time, at least to me in my perception uh, in Germany, was uh, quite a small field of study called computational linguistics. And basically ended up studying that for my undergrad. And um, yeah, like that, yeah. And uh, it's been, I think, back then i don't think i mean i don't think anyone was really aware of the the trajectory the field would take or the implications of that i also re remember in one of the, the first uh, courses that i took one of our professors um, that was just at a time where ibm um, watson just came out and where like um, the results of watson competing on jeopardy uh, made uh, made some headlines uh, so that was something that kind of inspired me or showed some potential of that technology um and so it's amazing to see yeah to see what we can do now mm -hmm. that's that's very nice also kind of interesting because from from now if uh, we look at from outside like uh, people may think like you start from like a machine learning kind of background to to the linguistics because i mean in our field there is all this kind of flavors right some people start more like a ml oriented background to to the language and like a, end up doing nlp or like some people do start from the linguistics and end up being more computational things uh, and you kind of start together which is uh, which is also kind of interesting in, in my opinion. But uh, when you start like your undergrad, when you kind of grow this interest, did you also think that you would be also interested in research or 
it was more like a like a, I, I don't know. Did you imagine that you would be really doing research and become a scientist, or maybe imagine yourself like like an engineer? Um, yeah, I think it's like in my, in my undergrad, I uh, I wasn't really or didn't really have the chance actually to be uh, fully so, like exposed to research. I only published my first papers in my PhD. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, I find it still quite amazing in contrast that now we get like for current PhD programs, but right? you get applicants who already have top tier conference publications. <laughs> so also the just the degree or the level of experience of people going on to do PhD has been tremendously uh, increased since then. And um, yeah, I think for, for me, it was more just a, a bit of uh, serendipity or just a, a series of uh, events I had, I was already getting some experience in, in industry through different internships in my undergrad of doing things related to, to NLP and machine learning. And um, already back then was kind of interested in like startups or getting some industry experience. So my original plan post undergrad was actually to, um, to work at a startup or to get some startup experience in the NLP space. And then maybe later on, continue on like postgrad and uh, potentially PhD. And um, only by kind of looking at different opportunities, I was in, in Ireland back then and uh, basically found out about um, more of the, these hybrid industry-based PhD programs and basically thought, okay, if I'm getting some industry experience, uh, if there's an opportunity to do some research at the same time, um, that sounds like a cool, cool combination. Yeah, so basically applied and got accepted in that and, um, yeah, it's definitely, I think, a bit more, more of an unusual experience compared to the standard PhD program. So it has its challenges in terms of balancing between research and more the applied fast-paced startup work. I see, I see. I, th this is something that I, I didn't know, actually, because that was going to be my uh, question, but it's a really nice kind of connection because I thought you were doing like a pure research because you had, at the time, like lots of different kind of papers, collaborations. And I was kind of curious, like how someone can like do that much of work at the same time. And I didn't even know that like, you also do some application-wise work at, uh, at during your PhD, actually. Yeah, I mean, uh, during the PhD or doing doing this work, I kind of, <laughs> I realized that uh, like, at least with regards to what the startup was doing, which was uh, like news analysis and kind of aggregating large uh, numbers of news articles and doing sentiment analysis and kind of opinion extraction of those. Um, I was more motivated and excited by just more research, like fundamental research re uh, related challenges. Um, and luckily had the, the freedom that I could embark on some of these more, more long term directions, even in this uh, uh, yeah, more immediate uh, startup environment. Um, so I think in, in practice, I probably did, uh, like did a lot more of the research work compared to the applied work in the end. I see. I see. That's very nice. So actually like the second part of the same question, like, so you start your PhD, yeah, started to do like a more free, relatively free, uh, like a research, but yeah, as I said, like, I know you have lots of collaborations from, from the PhD time. Like, uh, how did you manage to, I don't know, maybe find this kind of collaborations or involved in different projects or actually kind of managing the project as well. Starting from um, your PhD. Yeah, sure, sure. And I mean, uh, already like from the from the PhD and now as well, like um, being able to collaborate and learn from people from with different backgrounds, with different levels or like complementary sets of expertise is something I really, really enjoy and really like about the whole like the um, day to day or the research work in general, like having these collaborations. and. Um, in my PhD, I think part of it was out of necessity, um, essentially, because in my immediate environment, I, I realized that I didn't really have that many people I could learn from or really effectively collaborate in on in on these research projects. Um, so I was supposed to look a bit beyond um, beyond like the university or beyond like Dublin um, itself, and um, basically connected with other people from the community. Um, in uh, yeah, like under Sogard in Copenhagen or Barbara Blank in in, in the Netherlands, uh, based on kind of the uh, common like overlaps of interest and uh, uh, yeah, most of them just via via cold emails or sometimes like a mutual co uh, connection in common, and a lot of that kind of continued in uh, like long term or like multi paper collaborations. Mm -hmm. 
that's that's very nice to hear because uh, from our so our, our audience now, like some people may not be in really big labs or maybe they are kind of starting their research and and like it themselves. But this is actually not like a pause, right? Or this is not like a blocker, as you just said, like a reaching out people out of necessity also may end up something more even more beautiful uh, collaboration. So which is, I think, very inspiring in that sense. Also for uh, kind of connected again uh, in terms of the, the journey timeline. Uh, well, how did you start writing the blog post? Because I kind of remember, like, for example, very influential, I guess, like Imaginet movement of NLP, I think was one of your blog post title or something. So these blog posts were really kind of impactful and lots of people, I think, start to follow from the that time. So how did you decide like uh, this uh, blog post writing? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, for, for me, the uh, like blog post writing was um, kind of a, like a nice way um, to, to absorb or like synthesize, um, um, kind of organize and manage things uh, like uh, the papers and the the articles and the information I was uh, reading um, reading about. Um, so I mean, um, back then, like the blog post that you mentioned initially, the one on gradient descent optimizers. I mean, uh, back when we were still kind of coding uh, the the models uh, like uh, themselves, so doing that a bit more on the on the lower level, um, just understanding these different optimization behaviors was uh, quite useful. And so just delving a bit uh, deeper or like understanding this on the more fundamental level um, was something I, I uh, enjoyed. And I thought, okay, if I found that helpful, it might also be useful to other people. So I decided to share those. Uh, and I mean, similarly for, for other topics, I wanted to learn about, I was interested in um, a lot of um, just the, the way I in, enjoyed learning about a new topic was just in, in reading different papers on that topic and then kind of organizing or thinking about how we relate uh, to each other and what are the connections and writing writing that up in some like summary or extended post. And um, so a lot of that was kind of a gave rise to some, some blog posts. And, and then later on, once I had a bit more some more strong opinions on certain types of uh, like developments in the field or so, like on the image net, uh, like relevant comparisons, writing some some observations about about those as well. Um, so this was, uh, yeah, and in in the PhD, I mean, there's often um, like the just in terms of priorities or time management. I mean, I think it's still definitely the, the most value to spend time and really make progress on the research projects. Um, but whenever maybe things weren't exactly going the way I wanted to, or whenever I was like, maybe hitting some roadblock, um, I think writing on this blog was also a form of maybe procrastination for me, but kind of doing like changing gears a little, little bit, doing something where I still found that I derived some value from and uh, just was able to to work or use some um, some other skills rather than the, the coding side, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very nice uh, way of procrastinating uh, things, if, if it is the case. But how, how was like a feedback? Were you getting like a lot of feedback that at the time? I mean, probably now you are getting some feedback uh, quite, quite a lot when you post something. But how was uh, at the time when you kind of started? Um, yeah, I mean, back, back then, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I think you, you touched on a good point, I think, which is like the general, I think, feedback or like the lack of feedback, I think is like a general problem or general challenge in research, right? Because uh, the time, the periods between getting feedback are like between submitting a paper and then getting reviews for it or getting the final outcome three months later or so. So the, uh, the periods between feedback can be very long. And yeah, what I enjoyed about like this blog post was also it was a bit more of a lower stakes, uh, more immediate uh, way to get feedback. And so back then, I mean, I was, yeah, my main method of circulation was uh, Twitter and even on Twitter, um it was i think i mean i'm not sh i think it might have cha changed a little a little bit now but if you had some like well thought out articles or some articles where people were interested in they found some traction and then actually ended up getting like a lot of comments and all of them really in in good good faith uh, like i don't remember any um any really uh, like absolutely like neg negative comments or so, of course, people pointing out mistakes maybe or errors that I made, which is uh, which is valid. Uh, but in general, I was really very happy about just uh, the general like good faith, good nature-ness uh, of the responses. Yeah. 
I think I, uh, that's really, really valuable because like uh, in, in our field, like there is this kind of tendency. I think we think like uh, that the paper should be very like, a, I mean, very deep and very like a comprehensive, right? I mean, papers, publications supposed to be in that way, but this is not only a way to like a communicate what you are doing or your research and like a, this sort of starting point, at least in the be beginning, it's really, really valuable also to get feedback, but also to communicate what are you doing with, with other people in, in a broad sense, which is, which is very nice. Um, I want to a little bit move forward from here, then like a, after your PhD, you, I think immediately start in, in the industry uh, doing research, uh, obviously, but so what was your uh, like a kind of motivation when you, after the PhD, so now I understand that you all actually were kind of doing in, in between, but uh, yeah, I think you joined uh, DeepMind at the time. So what was the motivation? Um, sure, yeah, I mean, I think uh, like, so I finished my PhD just around the time where I think uh, like transfer learning pre-trained language models just really started taking off. So that was like the, um, the year or like, yeah, basically just soon after uh, from the release of BERT and like the first GPT model, uh, we also had like a first instance of uh, pre-trained uh, LSDM at, at the time. Um, so there was just a lot of potent like potential and a lot of, um, I think the first indications of this kind of scaling behavior that has um, uh, panned out over the, the last generations of models. Um, so it, just uh, yeah, so basically, I realized okay, there was just like so much uh, interesting work still to do in in research. Uh, so definitely wanted to continue. That was the motivation for continuing on the research side, and then um, for given that these models were kind of had the tendency to grow larger, going somewhere which had uh, sufficient compute to do interesting experiments or research in this space, which um, yeah, at the time was mainly at some like industry-based research labs uh, like like DeepMind and I guess also coming from like a quite a small lab or just a small space where I didn't really have a lot of people I could learn from directly um, just using this opportunity to be in a space where there's just experts from so many different areas that you can you can learn from and interact with. Mm -hmm. Yeah I see I think that these are also still I mean uh, in terms of the consideration, it's not all, all in terms of like a, just not to point out the industrial research, but very, very consideration like a compute. Now we have, we need more than ever, I guess, and it will only grow more. So yeah, uh, that's definitely reasonable. But you mentioned like a, after you join the DeepMind and like it's relatively huge research lab, right? Uh, so uh, lots of projects going at the same time. So I assume it's slightly bit different kind of environment, but then you, so I kind of skip in, in between, but like now uh, you moved uh, from like this huge lab to more like kind of dedicated focused startup uh, at Cohere. So, and then what what was your like a uh, thinking process? Like uh, what what did you kind of uh, make you go from this, uh, this route? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, part is, I mean, uh, like, Initially, or yeah, basically part is also kind of the, the reason that DeepMind uh, itself and like projects have are very big now. There's lots of like people involved um, and projects like like Gemini involve hundreds of uh, like collaborators and kind of a lot of layers of organization and um, bureaucracy as well. Um, so, and now also given that these models are so capable and so powerful, on, uh, powerful now, I uh, realized that I wanted to do something more um, like more on the applied side, actually seeing um, how people in the real world use these models and do this in a space where um, I can just move, uh, where we can move faster, uh, where I can have a bit more of a direct impact on uh, what models um, uh, end up in the hands of customers in the end. And um, so, and then kind of coupled with other other factors, with just the, the team and the people uh, here, uh, Cohere seems like the, the best option for that. That's very nice. I mean, just on so actually I have a question. I'm sure the audience from uh, uh, other people also have questions about that part, but uh, yeah, I will come, but I want to continue with a little bit on the resource side because so yeah, as I said, like you have lots of lots of different works. Uh, I mean, in different areas, transfer learning, modular approaches. But I want to jumpstart about multilinguality. Uh, also thinking about our time. So 
the modeling work yeah, also like it was something that you when you start your kind of research journey is uh, starting from that is like uh, was open interest or you kind of grow this multilinguality interest uh, like uh, as you go um yeah i mean i um yeah again as i as i said uh, earlier so like other languages was something i've been like interested in from like growing up basically so this was always like in the just in the back of my mind or like a general interest and then um in terms of research, I think the, the beginning of that was um, kind of in 2018 when I started working on uh, cross single word embeddings. And back then, um, there was just given that we had like these, uh, these word vectors and um, we were able to learn like vector space representations um, in different languages. And um, it was quite I think it was quite a like nice area to 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 study or do work in because uh, these uh, vector spaces had different uh, different properties across different languages. So in part, we could also um, kind of correlate or try to look at these vector spaces from a linguistic perspective, like how uh, how similar are they in different languages and where uh, how we can like improve the similarity or make them. Um, of align them across different languages and um, yeah, formulating some some papers plus that that research uh, that survey paper that you mentioned, um, and then uh, yeah, kind of from from then on, um, basically, um, given that we've as a community have been moving away from this uh, embedding based um, representation, and um, at the time models like multilingual words um, just came out and basically demonstrated that we can learn. Uh, like cross single representations um, reliably um, using these deep deep models, which at the time was quite um, surprising. Um, it uh, yeah, uh, so in this area there seemed to be like a lot of a lot of open things, a lot of interesting work, um, like a nice continuation of things that I had been working on, um, but also um, a bit um, like I just felt like it was. Um, there was a, a lack of work what was um, like important to do work in the space because we want as a community to have more representation and more access for our models in other languages and back then there wasn't as much work as, as there is now in that in that space um, uh, coupled with just yeah, a lot of interesting research uh, questions in terms of how these models actually learn how we can generalize how we can evaluate building even like resources which are still lacking uh, lacking to date um so just a yeah a, a kind of a number of different factors so. yeah exactly actually uh, i uh, i was also thinking like because uh, like if we think about the multilingual word embeddings it i mean it was definitely it has some uh, practical applications but it was more of like a research oriented i mean because it was kind of initial right but from that time to now when i think like it the, since the landscape is completely changed uh, this uh, like work on the multilinguality becomes completely like a necessity again because now we are this this LLMs like a part of our daily life almost and uh, like a capability multilingual capabilities of LLMs is extremely important like if it is only English I mean there's there's lots of lots of different languages that people speak and they cannot able to like they are not able to access if it is the case right so. Uh, but when you look at in that perspective, do you think where are we uh, in terms of the multilingual language understanding? Um, yeah, yeah, great, great question, and, and that's something I think I remember. Like looking looking back, I, I used to give like some some talks about like generally kind of the state of, of like multilingual uh, like language models and that how that uh, looking at how that's evolved over the last last years. And I remember like I I used to uh, I like to show like one one slide or like one graph in particular that showed for kind of recent models that have been published, kind of the fraction of English data that they've been trained on. And for a lot of the like earlier, earliest models in this um, area, like, um, yeah, BERT, uh, GVT um, style, style models, even from Google Palm, uh, like the first generations of that, all of them were really very English focused, um, had, if any, like a very small percentage of multilingual data in them. Um, so this was like until 2022 um, or so. Um, so, and then com in comparison, you had kind of a, a dedicated line of um, really, I mean, back then mainly encoder only um, multilingual pre-trained models like XMR, uh, multilingual Diverta, 
and in other variants, um, but most of these like a lot smaller and really like very distinct and not really typically used by the, the mainstream um, that, that much. And um, I was kind of hoping that at some point that these two lines would, uh, or um, imagining that they would uh, in, intersect, so that we would just have multilingual models um, that are the, uh, the default. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's really cool and exciting to see that, um, I mean, the current, uh, like all models that are uh, being provided by uh, like the major uh, like uh, companies, but also being trained uh, like in an open source space are really um, like multilingual mostly. I mean, they differ based on like the number of languages um, they serve. Um, some models serve like a smaller number of languages, um, but in general, I'm, I'm very happy of how how far the field and just kind of the, the general level of like acceptedness for just not only like moving beyond English has come in the in the last two or three years. Exactly. So I, I have the same feeling, but I also think like this kind of circularity because at like when starting with multilingual word and multilingual encoders in general, there was like a really huge focus on the multilinguality perspective. But after some time, like when this uh, like more generative models becomes, I mean, Kind of the, the state of the art and like more uh, like the, the main uh, main work of research then it started again with more like english oriented i think generative models now it is we are at the time that okay we have a like kind of state of the art in terms of uh, generative language models but now expanding the multilingual capabilities i think this is one of like and kind of the frontier that we are trying to reach uh, but in that sense, uh, the question that I had uh, for you, like, uh, I know there are multiple challenges uh, from, from the inside, but like, what would you say in terms of the challenges? What are uh, the things that, that you think still like, uh, I mean, hard to kind of solve or hard to approach? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there's lots of lots of questions. I mean, I think we can we can sort of start. Uh, uh, and I mean, the I think the challenging thing with like multilinguality overall is something that it affects like every every part of the um, the language model like training. Um, so on the uh, and I think a lot of the challenges just relate in um, uh, relate to our lack of understanding just of how um, these uh, like models um, have learned or uh, like. Um, aggregate multilingual representations and how they can use that um, in, in practice. Um, so I think there's kind of general um, uh, general questions regarding, for instance, doing pre-training. Um, there are, and I mean, over the last years, we've had different types of um, scaling laws, for instance, for how that could give us some some estimate or some recommendation for how we should uh, like train our models to perform well with certain amounts of data, with certain number of parameters. Um, also in the face of repeated or like redundant trainer uh, data during training, um, we like on the multilingual side. I think it's it's mostly been still uh, like not as principled um, yet, and um, we yeah we don't have a clear understanding of the the impact of different languages um, how that interacts with different uh, like domains um, also the role of like related languages which we know from like prior work on cross language transfer um, there's a lot of like transfer is or um, is a lot stronger if languages are kind of related uh, linguistically um, but we don't really know how that plays out in in pre training or how that should affect our or our choices of pre-trained data or the, how we design the mixture. Um, so um, yeah, so I think just uh, there, there's quite a uh, still um, a bit of work to do. And then um, generally, um, I think there's still yeah more challenges regarding just underst like understanding scaling across different stages. So how we can uh, most effectively scale uh, like instruction following behavior across other languages. There are different of shortcuts that you can do in terms of like translating uh, data or entering like a, a few number of samples. Um, but um, yeah, how this actually um, like affects performance, whether models are more likely to produce translation ease then, or whether they still exhibit um, certain like degenerate behavior um, is still uh, relatively unclear. And um, a lot of that kind of lack of understanding also relates to the lack of high quality evaluation metrics. Um, because if you look to like some of the uh, like papers or tech reports from some of the, the biggest models, right, for like GPT-4 or like cloud, cloud models or, or so, um, a lot of the common evals are just based on 
um, English evals that have been translated to other languages. Um, so they're not really actually uh, very reliable to properly assess how well our models do or like generalize to new languages. So, um, or even, I mean, we've, we've just been, um, the, the newest model from here is on this uh, chatbot arena um, uh, uh, platform where people can like rate different responses uh, from, from different models in a blind setting, um, but also with the types of responses that people provide are mostly, I think like 95% or so are in English. Um, so we have comparatively little signal in other languages in these types of more realistic, more uh, user interactions. Exactly. Actually, uh, like I, uh, that was kind of my follow-up because uh, when we were working, I mean, you were also part of the work in, in the AYA, uh, like a data set collection and like a kind of instruction, while doing the instruction fine tuning, the most, uh, I, I would say like a most, uh, uh, the hardest challenge was the evaluation. Because I mean, in general, I think evaluation is really, really tricky for the large, super large uh, language model because, I mean, um, different evol different benchmarks try to kind of me uh, measure different capabilities. I think what we need sort of like a holistic view, but when there is also multilinguality aspect and multiple languages, like creating such holistic view is extremely difficult. So I know your team also like puts up lots, lots of effort to, to get a bit of better understanding of models uh, capabilities and evaluating them measuring them so what what would you say like more maybe like a, what what would be the kind of hints to to understand uh, models capabilities in different languages yeah i mean i think at the, at the moment still the the best uh, yeah the best way or what we what we do it uh, in our team is to do human evaluation on some some prompts that we've uh, like created internally in other languages and to um because i think in the end um these models like the, the generations um, or the, the types of tasks that we evaluate them are so complex that it's uh, yeah it's very difficult to um, to reliably automate um, evaluate them automatically um, so the the strongest or clearest signal is still like having yeah, getting that feedback from humans and having them look at the data um, but yeah at the same time we're trying to to find ways to to automate um, that I mean these days there are like um, language models themselves use it use as reward models or as judges for these kind of automatic comparisons, um, which already in English they've shown like problems, biases, um, tendencies to prefer models that have produced just longer sequences or longer longer outputs, um, and we haven't even scratched the surface of the types of um, behavior that these English centric models still. Um, uh, like what, how they how useful they are in in other languages. Um, so that's something that we are we're also gonna gonna look more into in depth. I see. I see. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think in general that's kind of a good news for for uh, like a junior uh, researcher in the field because there are really lots of open questions, especially in the multilinguality uh, aspect of of the large language models. Like I think the, wherever they can just touch, there is a research question to be sold. I think this is kind of a good news. I mean, also kind of exciting uh, for, for our field as well. So before yeah. kind of closing this uh, this area, uh, of course, I want to also ask, uh, uh, because we kind of uh, we released very recently Command R and Command R Plus, more concrete like last Thursday actually, and it gets really positive feedback, also in terms of the multilinguality uh, side. I and mean, models are pretty strong, uh, re really well received. Uh, so maybe like a kind of uh, also like there's a question I kind of rephrase and like a, very broadly what is the heck like yeah, how did you make it kind of very very powerful in multiple languages? Um, yeah, I mean I think some uh, I think some decisions or I think the general theme is definitely just designing the model kind of with multilinguality in mind or not just looking at um, at English performance. I mean. Um, that part, and I think we had that and mentioned that in the blog post as well. Um, part of that, is, for instance, is just having better tokenization or kind of more um, like more efficient um, tokenization for other languages. Um, and this is, what, I mean, the tokenization algorithm itself is like unchanged or it's kind of the same like other people use as well. It just differs based on the distributions of the data and um, like having more uh, more data in different languages represented there. Um, and then similarly, I think. Um, 
for on the, the pre-training side and, and as well for instruction tuning, just focusing on kind of high quality data. So I think in practice we've seen, and I mean, this has been also observed in like other research studies that often uh, not just uh, like not having like huge amounts of, of data, particularly for instruction tuning is useful, but actually having uh, like high quality um, data. And um, in our case, we had have been working with internal and external annotators to create uh, like multilingual data and um, kind of different instruction tuning data sets. And I think in practice, we've seen that that had a like a strong effect, and particularly for the kind of more like user interactions or um, the conversational um, behavior. Um, yeah, and then I think as it comes to like iterating on the on the final models or like having the, the final ablations, having really some some metrics that uh, that measure what you're looking for, so having some like reliable multilingual metrics. We had a couple more like automatic metrics that we were looking at, and being able to make kind of decisions fast based based on these, depending on which um, which model candidate you want to select. Yeah, that's that's very nice. I think that's very nice. Uh... So what what would be kind of uh, just to close this uh, kind of session like what what is what is next uh, what are you kind of focusing now in your team uh, in general um yeah i mean in, in practice so i think there's still a lot of a lot of areas so on the human evaluation side for instance where we've noticed certain like use cases or types of behavior that like work already like well in english or we are not as good as we want to be in in certain languages or we're still um a bit like yeah we're still not seeing uh, exactly the desired behavior so um there's definitely some more things that we can do on the instruction tuning side just to make our model more um um yeah better for certain use cases um another big area of focus is just generally allowing more controllability um of model generations um so we are uh, kind of working on um uh, together with the rest of the command team to add um uh, to have basically preambles and kind of that uh, allow people or users to provide system level information. And um, this is already, I mean, controlling generations across lots of different dimensions, like tone, style, different types of constraints is already challenging in English. Um, so doing this kind of in a, in a way that is also useful and generalizable in other languages is, um, is kind of a, a bigger, um, bigger area of focus. Um, and lastly, kind of other other areas um, like the the cohere models and what is quite useful for enterprise usage is um, kind of retrieval and being able to provide um, faithful uh, responses uh, with references or that um, kind of certify whatever uh, the model uh, the model claims, and so making sure that this type of uh, like uh, citation um, behavior and that these references also um, work like across all other languages and that if the model um, tries to get some new piece of information via web search that it knows that it uh, kind of does the uh, the web queries in the right language or in the right uh, like setting um, kind of making sure that actually works at at scale is also I think, a, a big uh, a big research area still mm -hmm. yeah thanks thanks uh, that's uh, yeah we are looking for it uh, i think it's very very exciting really all of these uh, areas so i want to now kind of move uh, i will come to questions in like last 10 minutes or so but I, I, before that i want to kind of move uh, like a more uh, like so, sorry i'm just uh, closing the window here it's getting with lights <laughs> from like a research to your uh, your life in general uh, because I mean, we are also kind of curious like a what you do in your free time or like i have a couple of questions about that but like uh, my my first thing that i i always kind of ask uh, in these kind of chats like so i know you have multiple works at the same time different projects or different like lots of work priorities but like um what is your kind of day-to-day -day? like how can you manage how do you manage your uh, like a day-to-day -day work um yeah i think i mean <laughs> it's a good good question uh i think it's it often differs a bit um i think given that uh i think before it was probably a bit more uh, like well defined i think at uh, at the moment given that like with, with launches and things kind of changing changing a bit more more quickly in the startup environment at cohere i don't think i have like a, a clear um, a clear kind of day-to-day -day, like structure there. It's often a bit more like project dependent or I'm trying usually to have like dedicated kind of 
windows of time um, to to work on like one particular project can uh, kind of all allocated um, compared to other times or like time uh, blocks mostly in the afternoon um, focusing like more on meetings um, and then mornings I mean uh, yeah mornings a, a bit more for like catching up on on Slack on Twitter or in other conversations. Um, yeah, uh, I think one one thing I'm I don't I'm not finding as much time to as I would like is uh, catching up on papers or like reading papers um, these days. Uh, that is usually something I do like on, on weekends or Saturdays if there's uh, if there's time. Um, but uh, yeah, lately that has been a bit difficult to kind of uh, place uh, place in the in the day to day. I see. I see. Yeah. Also, like probably like a calendar kind of managing your <laughs> your time even like out of your freedom like because maybe like people uh, like me sometimes putting random meetings and like <laughs> then you you need to manage those meetings as well i guess yeah that's uh but uh, that sounds, sounds pretty good and like also i'm kind of curious like you you already said like there are also lo lots of moving pieces in in the work of course but um, what do you do your in your like spare time or free time to kind of recharge yourself or like a refocus again. Do you have particular hobbies or something that you tend you you used to like? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, these days. So we we have a um, last year had a small uh, yeah uh, uh, babies. So I think these days a lot of the the time I'm not at work is just uh, mostly spent on spent with my son or with with family, and then mainly in the evening when he's. Um, when he's in bed and hopefully <laughs> sleeps through the night, um, <laughs> mainly just um, yeah, spending some time uh, with my wife. I think like one thing that we we liked or we did a lot like through the pandemic as well is uh, like play um, play board games um, uh, like yeah, together like RPG style uh, style board games. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise like more just kind of reading reading a book, uh, some some fiction books uh, like in my in my free time to try to like relax or like recharge a bit from um, from the day to day. I see, I see. But yeah, you already have a baby, so it's uh, kind of important uh, uh, thing to like uh, recharge yourself, I guess, automatically. So <laughs> yeah, I'm good with that. Uh, I assume. So yeah, I have a couple of questions. These questions are more like uh, like. A, one word answer or like one sentence answer is really like a just kind of fast pace uh, because uh, like a, I like this small uh, last session. So this is uh, maybe I can start with like who inspired you uh, to start researching that you think most impactful? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I had to, uh, yeah, as I said, I think my, my journey, sorry, I'm, I'm not really fulfilling the one, one word re or one person requirement no, here. No, it's nice. um, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, it was, uh, yeah, as I said, I think my journey into research or my uh, entrance into research was a bit more serendipitous. There wasn't like a clear person that inspired me to do a PhD. I think it was mainly I think the person with biggest impact were my initial mentors in my PhD, um, so yeah, like I'm under Sugar Barbara Plank, um, yeah, early on. Okay, very nice. Yeah, uh, I mean, she is great. So I, I also worked with her. So it's, yeah, <laughs> it would be definitely on my list as well. So the second question is like, a, can you name one paper which is very in influential to you? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I think that has also like changed a bit throughout uh, the PhD. I think over the last years, one paper that I'd like to go back to is, um, I think it's called the, the State and Fate of Linguistic Diversity in NLP. So it was basically, I think, in tw from 2020, um, a paper from I think Microsoft Research Asia uh, looking at uh, the general um, state of like multilinguality in NLP, how different languages are uh, like represented in the, the community and basically kind of noting, okay, there's this stark discrepancy between the amount of data that is available in many languages and um, and uh, and English. So there's a lot of, um, uh, and kind of highlighting some things that we could do to uplift or to equalize that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember that paper. It's really, really nice, uh, nice one, definitely. And this is the last, and I see there are multiple questions, so I want to come to those questions uh, early. But so what do you think like the most influential paper of of yourself? So which paper we should look at uh, just after this chat? 
Um, I think one, I mean, one paper that I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I had to like the, I think the, these kind of like survey papers, which um, were like highlighted interesting, like, or just kind of summarized some work, which um, were quite like, at least like cited, cited frequently and quite popular. But I think in terms of impact, um, I think there's, um, yeah, one paper on like one of the first um, pre-trained models, uh, we call it uh, ULM fit. Mm -hmm. um, so was one of the, the first models to um, first pre-trained uh, pre-trained models in NLP kind of together with uh, El uh, the ELMO model at the time and different to ELMO, um, which basically proposed to use um, the features that they had learned um, kind of as a, or the representations that they had learned as features in a downstream model. Um, I think it was clear to, to me and, or, Jeremy and I, um, who was my was a co-author on that paper, I think had a very strong intuition that this feature-based usage was not really the, the best approach to actually use language models, but in practice, fine-tuning them would be the best um, uh, best way to go. And in particular, in that paper, we also um, kind of looked at other things and, and specifically uh, fine-tuning it on uh, doing specific data before you fine-tune it on the labels data. Um, so I think we had, uh, I think a lot of a uh, lot of ideas or things that were uh, kind of um, were very relevant or were then kind of taken to the uh, scaled up and um, shown to to work in practice at scale by a lot of the, the later approaches. Yeah, uh, it was definitely a great paper. So yeah, in my mind, it's always like uh, as I said, this imaginate uh, imaginet moment of NLP uh, that and kind of attach it with UML, uh, ULM fit. So it's really, uh, it was quite an uh, impactful way, definitely. Uh, thanks thanks for all, all your really sincere answers. So now I actually, I wanted to kind of ask at kind of closing, uh, what kind of advices that you can give to like a new researcher, new PhD, but I just see that there's already a, a question. Let me kind of uh, maybe, because it's a bit more broader, uh, it's, which is nicer. But, uh, we can start with uh, that question uh, for QA sessions, uh, so to speak. So the question is the NLP space is evolving really fast and it is getting uh, increasingly difficult to keep up with it. Uh, what would you advise uh, to be new PhDs? But I, I would like to add like, a, not only for PhDs, but like a, in general, that people that kind of interested in either in the more resource side or also maybe in kind of application side, uh, but also, uh, our attendees also adds like, especially those interested in multilinguality and low resource languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for sure. And I mean, I think the the kind of the, the speed or the like the pace at which, I mean, even like new models are being published, right? Or new new developments come out, I think can be quite <laughs> quite daunting. Um, I think, I mean, even to uh, to like people who've been in the field for, for a while. Um, and I mean, this is something I think that has accelerated, but but generally, kind of that notion of okay, there's like too many too many things going on was already present like uh, like before um, as well. And um, I think also, I mean, I, I I've, I've been hearing or generally I kind of felt that there was this additional sentiment in like PhD students or in the community that it gets harder it's harder to research now, right? Because all the models are so compute um, intensive. And um, so, what do you what do you want to focus on as a someone like uh, in, in university? And uh, yeah, uh, as I, I hope that kind of became clearer clearer through this um, conversation. That I think there's a lot of a uh, lot of research directions, um, many of which are not are not that compute intensive, or a lot of just um, relates to any part of the model. Um, interesting research questions that can be explored, and um, I think as a PhD student, I would just kind of recommend not not trying to follow kind of the latest craze or even like trying to use like the latest model every time. So choosing a model that kind of serves well for use case that is maybe established, accepted, or uh, like that people uh, like use in the community and kind of sticking with that, using that for for your studies if you have time. Maybe I mean evaluating another model, um, but not uh, yeah trying not to suffer maybe from from formal or needing to use the, the latest model because in in practice like there's so many commonalities right between uh, between these different models in terms of the architecture or the data that they have been trained on. Um, so if you make observations on like one one type of uh, model, it's very likely that 
they would transfer at least to some extent to, to similar related architectures. Um, so just more focusing on kind of the, the research problem, the main questions you, you want uh, you want to ask, and uh, maybe things that are intellectually interesting or that we're currently lacking understanding of, uh, rather than just using the, the latest model. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Also, like a one like a small addition to your advice, like. I mean, it's it's very nice. That's also very exciting that the our space is re moving really fast. But also, like in terms of the research perspective, I would just suggest, like, okay, I mean, uh, if there is a research question in, in your mind, maybe don't get distracted. There are lots of things happening at the same time. But as you try to answer the question, it will probably also get connected with with the space and with the pace. That's uh, I think that's completely uh, doable uh, for for. Uh, junior researchers. So I will continue with other questions, maybe more kind of more researchy. Uh, uh, what advice can you give uh, for someone working on creating LLM datasets for low resource languages? Um, yeah, great. I mean, yeah, uh, I think uh, definitely keep keep on doing that. We need more of that type of data. Also, I mean, yeah, thanks. Uh, like I had mentioned, or I think one of the other aspects that drew me to here was just the work uh, Aya and Queer for AI have been doing in this space, because I think this is super, super important to do this kind of work. Um, I think I would really focus on um, like quality over, over quantity. So really making sure that you get like high quality data that is uh, like reviewed and um, that you're really confident in uh, in the level of uh, level of quality of the data that you're uh, that you're creating, um, yeah, because there's uh, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, bean studies related to just having few high quality examples for instruction tuning that can be very helpful. Um, also, looking at data um, that is um, just really indicative or more um, representative of uh, the use cases in your region or in your language and uh, like natural in your language. So go, moving away, I mean, still maybe using machine translation as a baseline, um, but ultimately moving away from translation needs and translate data and having data that is um, has been naturally generated or mined or obtained from, from actual speakers in, in that language. And ideally, uh, reflects, uh, goes a bit away from classification type use cases and looks more at kind of more challenging types of generation tasks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the answer. I mean, uh, in in all these shapes, starting from translation as a baseline to all other the advice that you give, but I think definitely this is very, very required for, for our community. I mean, especially for the lower source languages because we need the data sets to train models, fine tune models, because this is extremely important. Uh, another question, if uh, I cannot have in-house human evaluation uh, for a certain language, what is the best way to evaluate generations apart from semantic similarity? If we go one step further, is it possible at this moment to detect hallucination in generation for medium to low resource languages? Um, yeah, good, good questions. I think that that, uh... That whole area, I think, is still a big, a big challenge or a big, um, yeah, a big area opportunity for research. Um, I think beyond human evaluation, I mean, we have, I think, getting uh, getting better at doing uh, like automatic evaluation, or I guess, I mean, it's yeah, very commonly used to have some automatic evaluation um, using large models for for English, and um, to some extent, that is also being extended for other languages. Um, but um, yeah, we don't really have a, a good understanding of the um, pro, like uh, advantages and weaknesses of these models, um, particularly when it comes to looking at more fine-grained um, type of um, errors that that model make. Um, so yeah, I unfortunately don't have a good answer on that. Uh, other than if you are want to do some work in that area, maybe like studying studying this aspect and kind of looking at how you can more efficiently um, allocate it, uh, like evaluate it. Um, I think one, one, maybe one thing to make a bit more progress there is to see whether you can um, kind of divide or break down a problem into sub-problems that can be more easily evaluated, um, where you could uh, maybe rely on certain like smaller classifiers or um, yeah, certain, mo uh, certain models to evaluate these sub-aspects uh, 
and can guarantee higher uh, higher confidence um, than um, having a single model evaluate the entire generation. Um, but mm -hmm. again, this is quite like problem specific and uh, depends really on the, the different aspects. So it's um, yeah, but I would love to see more more work in the space. Yeah, and the only thing that I can add that's a good answer, but also like not not a solution, but I think this, as for example, this uh, detecting hallucination in medium low resource languages. This is a great research question in my opinion. Like really, even taking an existing model, uh, multilingual, and uh, measuring this differences in terms of the hallucination, I think that would be something definitely uh, people would be very interested in, and I would uh, suggest go, going for it and doing some maybe simple analysis to more broad. Uh, evaluation would be really nice. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. I know on that note quickly, we had, for instance, a, a, like a small study at Nuki last year where we looked at how models in cross-lingual question answering um, uh, like hallucinate. And even in this kind of very constrained setting where you provide some paragraphs to the model and it, um, even when it's able to um, predict like the um, correct response so it predicts yes if correct response is, is yes as well it often actually doesn't um use like the right information from the input or the the paragraphs that were retrieved didn't even contain that information so there's still um yeah and i mean this a lot of that study relied on human evaluation to be able to like identify those um those relations um so i think there's a lot of lot of room and a lot of scope for kind of digging really looking in detail at uh, the quality of uh, generations and where you observe or what may or might cause some of these hallucinations. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is the last question. Uh, is it optimal to let transformer uh, architecture detect language families uh, or sing, uh, linguistic similarity? Or is it better to take uh, employ pre-existing human understanding on such a topic? So which is a more stronger factor in terms of training and LLM, linguistic similarity, similar alphabet? I think this is uh, the question. Maybe let, kind of let me try to rephrase it. Like, a, a, would that be better to kind of give some sort of bias when training uh, lamps in terms of language families or linguistic similarities, or we should let transformer just to learn from the data? Um, yeah, good, good question. And I mean, yeah, I guess I said before that, like having um, uh, you that we see a strong transfer between languages that are like, linguistically um, similar. Um, and I mean, for prior models like multilingual um, bird, for instance, right? There's been some studies that that showed if you train it on like multilingual data, that in the representations it kind of learns like the uh, phylogenetic uh, tree, with a kind of the relation um, between different languages and the, the linguistic similarity kind of implicitly just by training on the data in these different languages. Um, so I don't think we need necessarily need to kind of encode this like additionally or um, uh, like provide additional like metadata on that to the model, um, but I think it can definitely um, like uh, we can it can motivate or like inspire how much data we might want to uh, like collect or how we want to create our mixture. If we already have a lot of data in Hindi, for instance, we might need few data in um, some other Indian languages um, where which are linguistically really uh, related. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think it's maybe more more on the data level. I think would be most effective. Thanks. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think we kind of uh, uh, come to the end uh, in terms of the time. But it was it was really great to uh, having a chat with you, Sebastian. And thanks for your your having time and also answering all the questions. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks everyone also joining uh, for our fireside chat. Uh, yeah. Is there anything that you would like to add, uh, like a last remark? Um, yeah, I mean, th thanks for thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. It's really really cool and yeah, great to chat with you after and great to yeah be in the same company after having collaborated mm -hmm. before. And yeah, again, I think for everyone uh, who's doing a PhD or considering a PhD in this um, space, I I do think it's uh, yeah, I think it's a very exciting time. I think there's lots of um, lots of uh, like new capabilities, but as many or even more like unexplored uh, directions. Um, so I think, um, yeah, you don't, yeah, just uh, don't let yourself get intimidated and rather be like inspired by everything that is out there. And I think maybe the other thing to emphasize is just um, kind of the, the usefulness also of having maybe some more like applied um, applied uh, skills in this space. So if you're if you are able to kind of working in 
uh, like yeah, some like smaller companies, uh, startups, or uh, getting your your hands dirty with some open source implementations uh, to really like understand a bit better how these models uh, like work on, under the hood. Thanks. Great advice. Thanks. Thanks again. Thanks everyone. Uh, see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.